in a nutshell, what happens here is that you have an energy system of some sort. Let's say you start with a very simple thing. You have a heat pump somewhere that's connected to the electrical grid. That's a multi-energy system, but that's not all there is to it, right? That's not everything you can simulate. For instance, you might take into your simulation that, well, this heat pump is located in a house that has a thermal storage tank. And there's radios in the house, there's people coming in and out, and you want to figure out how that system works. But you might also be interested in saying, well, uh, this house has a now a solar panel and somebody's put up an electric vehicle charging spot and there's an electric vehicle outside. How does that system work? But then again, maybe maybe that's not really what you're interested in. What you're really interested in is figuring out how you scale that up into having a district or a small area where there's many houses. Maybe there's some local energy storage as well. And all of these things have to work together and how do they talk to, uh, to each other and how do they communicate? Then again, maybe you're more interested in uh, having a district heating system in there so that the heating systems of all these different houses connect and interlock with each other and somehow support each other through the heating system. But then when you include that, you also remember, oh, there's actually a transmission system at a high level where we have some thermal energy producers, some renewable energy producers, and these are all feeding into both the electricity side and the district heating side. And then when you think about that, you realize, oh, yeah, it's not just one transmission system. There's actually an entire European transmission system. And on that entire transmission system, you're talking about exchanging energy between many different sources and sinks. And you're talking about uh, something that's going to happen over the scale of 20, 30, 40 years. And then, of course, the issue is that you're never going to fit this in a single tool. In other words, you're never going to find a tool that allows you to simulate the liquid flow in millions of heat pumps over a multi-decade timescale. So somehow you have to cut and you have to decide what's necessary for me to have in order to run my simulation and what's necessary for me to have it at the right scale and abstraction so I can ask the questions, but I don't end up waiting forever for this thing to finish. And the issue here is, of course, there are so many tools out there that allow you to do parts of the system, whole system, maybe only in some abstraction, maybe in the other. And so what we're hoping to do today is to show to you some of the tools that we have internally in the consortium and how those tools allow us to simulate various systems that show various questions. So the remainder of the webinar is going to look at all these tools. We're going to look at how the simulation method matches the different research questions that our members have. We're going to look at each method and highlight some specific benefits and requirements of that method. For example, if I use this tool chain, what is required for me to represent in my system in order for me to get through uh, with the question I want to ask? And we're hoping that by giving you an overview of all these approaches, you're going to get some idea about what could be interesting from your side for your particular question to simulate the system that you're interested in. So the structure for the rest of the webinar is that uh, we're going to have a series of talks from different research groups. Uh, you can see the list on the right. It is Xu Wu from KIT IPE. It's Alexander Engelmann from KIT IAI. It's Benedict Leitner from AIT. It's myself. Uh, and it is Frank Mike Hubini from VITO, that is the Flemish Institute for Technology. And each of these are going to present some research question or some system that they're simulating. They're going to show you how does their tool chain work in kind of broad strokes and give you an overview of how you run a simulation in that tool chain. Now, we're not going to have time to go really in depth with the tool chains, but we hope that by giving you an example, you're going to have a, a sense of what goes into each of them. And we're hoping that that also allows you to discriminate between the different tool chains and see which tool chains might be applicable to your problem. Finally, we'll have some concluding remarks. And with that said, I'd like to hand over to our first presenter, Xu Xia Wu from Wu Institute of Technology. Hello, uh, hello everyone. Uh, thanks for the introduction from TUI. Uh, my name is Xu Xia Wu from KIT, and today I'm going to present to you our simulation uh, and optimization at KIT. And the research question that our tool chain is trying to address is how to optimize the capacity of the battery for a multi-energy system with renewable generation. Uh, I will start with our motivation of integration 
the battery and storage into our system, and then introduce you how do we model the system and use MATLAB and Simulink to simulate and optimize our model. So the IPE is the Institute for Data Processing and Electronics. We are mainly working on assembly and connection technology for electronics system uh, in the packaging fab. Therefore, this factory is an uh, energy intensive component on the campus. By introducing energy storage system charged by photovoltaics, we are bringing um, several benefits for ourselves, which plays a role as the electricity customer. We can utilize the redundant uh, renewable energy more efficiently and allow less dependency on grid and reduce the network charge for peak load. For local system, uh, the energy storage improves the self-consumption rates and is a burden on medium and low voltage grid. And of course, the energy storage using renewable energy helps to reduce the CO2 emission and uh, environmental damage. And to study the battery system for our use case, we have several requirements. First, uh, the first one is uh, we have a relatively high uh, time resolution, so we want to have a simple but accurate enough model for the battery. Uh, the model needs to be trade-off between the accuracy and the calculation speed. And the second, our tool chain needs to be able to simulate both electrical and thermal domain for the system. Uh, there is some electrical component and also thermal components. And at last, we should achieve the optimization goal to find the uh, suitable battery capacity for this local energy system. MATLAB is a great solution for the requirement we propose. The network-based uh, modeling and model-based design make it much easier and convenient to set up a system model for the simulation. And in MATLAB, there are some powerful toolboxes, uh, for example, the uh, problem-based optimization and some parallel computing toolbox, which can ac uh, accelerate the whole process to achieve our optimum goal. And for the modeling of our system, we separately uh, model the electrical part and the thermal domain for our office and the factory. Uh, concerning the electrical part, we imported the uh, electric load directly from our database and interpolate the data to fit our time resolution. And uh, the renewable generation is not directly available. Therefore, we need to set up a photovoltaic model and to calculate the PV generation according to the solar radiation data from the weather tower on KIT campus. And for the lithium battery, we use uh, I use it as uh, energy storage. We consider it as an uh, equivalent circuit model. Uh, I will further talk about this model in the next slide. And for the thermal part, um, we use the thermal RC model for the office building. Uh, the model was developed by our colleague uh, Alexander. He will further introduce this model in his session. And for our control system, uh, we are using a rule-based control function for the controller in the model. Uh, for, the, for the battery modeling in the Simscape, uh, we use in, uh, the uh, Simscape to create the model for, the, for this uh, multi-physical uh, multi system within the Simulink environment. We custom the model uh, using the Simscape language and write in MATLAB script. And the uh, non-linear effect within the battery is also considered by using the lookup table. And we use the climate chamber to test the internal impedance under different temperature and different state of charge and different uh, charging and discharging current. To use a component, we follow the workflow for the model-based simulation in Simulink. First, we de uh, determine the simulation goal and then the component inside. After the modeling of the system configuration uh, and each component inside, we analyze the model and decide if the components or the design, new design is required. Next, we test each component separately and then integrate these uh, components and test the whole system. To define the optimization in MATLAB, we can use the optimization toolbox, and our goal is to use the simulation result to optimize our objective function. 
First, we need to set up the optimization problems. Uh, we can describe the problems and constraints in mathematical expression with uh, equations and in equations. And then we create optimization problem object, which can be solved by the optimization toolbox in MATLAB. Uh, in MATLAB, there are two approaches for solving the problem. And uh, they're uh, problem-based or the store-based. Uh, in our case, we use problem-based approach here. In the optimization process, there are different uh, optimization solver, and uh, uh, we can also specify some setting in the script uh, with user interface or with directly with uh, script. After the finish of the optimization, the result can be easily plotted and reviewed with MATLAB. Later in the demo, I will show you how to use this optimization toolbox for the simulation. Because our time resolution is very high, so it usually takes a long time for, for the simulation to run. So there is a parallel toolbox we can use for accelerating the simulation. With parallel computing toolbox, we can run many Simulink simulation at the same time, um, multiple CPU core. Uh, we can create a parallel pool of worker on local machine or scale up to a cluster. With the script, we can specify the parallel workers to run the same model with different inputs or parameter setting in the optimization process. Uh, in this case, we simulate the model for optimization in parallel and can save lots of time. The parallel computing can be monitored with simulation manager interface, and I will also show this uh, simulation later in the demo. Here is the example of our flex office and the factory system. Now we are going to give you an example of how to run the optimization of our model. Here is the Simulink model of our flex office and factory system. And in the Simulink, we have modeled the controller, the renewable generation, and the electric load, and the lithium battery. For the battery model, we use the equivalent circuit model with third order RC. The input to the model is the solar radiation, electric load from the factory and the office, and the thermal environmental input. And there are several outputs, like the imported electricity from the grid, the electricity consumption from photovoltaics, and surplus electricity feed into the grid. This output signal will be used to specify the optimization. So let's go and start our optimization tool. We go into the analysis, response optimization, and bring up the graphical user interface. First, we need to define variables that we want to optimize. So we get this window showing the parameter from our workspace. And in this case, our design variable is the battery capacity. We can add the plot of the design variable to show how it changed during the optimization. Then we need to specify the objective function for the optimization. The requirement function is already written in MATLAB script. Here, we can add the model signal that we want to log to be specified as the requirement input. And we need to go back to the model and click on the signal in order to select it. We see that this is selected now. Similarly, we add the other two signals required for the function. And if we click OK, it will automatically generate the iteration plot of the requirement function output. In the optimization option dialog, we can choose different methods and algorithms to optimize the function. To run this optimization, we can directly click optimize or generate MATLAB code to further specify the setup. Now we run the optimization directly. Here is the result of the optimization for one of our scenarios. As can be seen, the optimization was finished after five iterations. The requirement function output was reduced after the optimization, and the optimum battery capacity was already saved to the workspace. Finally, the last part of the demo is using parallel simulation to accelerate the optimization process.
In the past, you need to write some complicated scripts. I'm not going to go into the details of that code, but you need to put significant efforts in this to get it going. Now MATLAB introduces a new and improved parser command, which gives a streamlined design-centric workflow for running large-scale parallel simulation. You start off by creating a simulation input object for a model. You can specify any changes that you would like to make to the model go on the simulation input object and create an array of these objects that defines the set of simulation that you would like to run and then pass them to the parsem command. We can use this workflow with multiple cores of a desktop or multiple compute nodes of a cluster or cloud to set up the parallel workers. During the running of parallel simulation, we can use the simulation manager to monitor and get a live status on the update of the simulations on the parallel workers. There is also another view where we can check the result of a particular simulation right from the user interface. You can select particular runs, look at the parameter values that were used for these runs. With one click, you can plot this result in the simulation data inspector and use the tools in the inspector for comparison and further analysis. Yeah, thanks too for handing over to me. So yeah, my name is Alexander Engelmann from also from Karlsruhe Institute of Technology. And in our group of KIT, we are focusing on optimization and control of uh, modern energy systems. In contrast to the talk before, we use optimization here not for designing a specific system, so for example, for sizing a battery or something like this, uh, we are using it for optimal control, which means that for an existing system, we would like to optimally control the systems but one after the other. So um, just give a, a, a short outline of my talk. So um, we use this optimal control for thermal building control. And the first point will be why we would like to do that. Then I'll give a short introduction to thermal building modeling for this uh, control and also on the considered control approach. As I said, the goal is to use thermal inertia of of buildings to uh, store renewable energy over production. And uh, a motivation for this is if you have a look at the uh, EU's final energy consumption, then you see that around about half of the final energy consumption is used for heating and cooling of uh, buildings or an industry. So if you want to have a 100% uh, renewable production, we also need to consider this uh, large share on the uh, final energy consumption. And the nice thing about this uh, thermal part in the energy domain is that the, usually the thermal storages are much cheaper than electrical storages. You see here, for example, the price for thermal storage is around about 70 euros per kilowatt hour, whereas in the electrical domain, you uh, pay several hundred of euros per kilowatt hour. And the idea is now in hours where you have an overproduction of renewable energy generation that you store that in the thermal domain, domain for example, in a thermal buffer or in walls and ceilings or also in the room temperature of uh, buildings. Yeah, that's what we this talk is about, and specifically about uh, how to design a controller to uh, induce such a behavior to a building. So first of all, uh, in almost every case you want to design a controller, you need a certain model of a building. And of course, building modeling is not a new topic, so it's a uh, it's done for a very long, very long time, and there are well-established tools, for example, this Energy Plus or Modelica uh, for building modeling. But usually these uh, tools are not well suited for uh, predictive control because um, uh, mainly for two reasons. First of all, usually they're quite detailed, so you have to have models. That you, you can, for example, model individual layers of walls or something like this, and it's a little bit too detailed for us because we need a computationally tractable model for, for this control approach you would like to drive here. And also usually the modeling format is uh, not directly usable because we need an explicit expression of the ordinary differential equation. Because of that, there are special approaches and also tools for building modeling and control. For example, this open build toolbox or this BRCM toolbox, which use uh, RC equivalent circuit models for uh, this modeling the thermal behavior of buildings. And now I'm going to show you how that 
works in a nutshell. So basically, to derive such an RC model, uh, you only need uh, three types of equations. So the first one is you just um, have this heat transport equation, which is says that the uh, uh, heat transfer through a certain material is just proportional to the temperature difference. And this Gij here is kind of a thermal conductance, which depends on the parameters of the, for example, of a wall or of a ceiling. Uh, then the second equation is that you have energy balance at each node. So it simply says that the inflowing power has to be the same as the outflowing power minus the stored energy in this node. And the stored energy in this node is just um, a simple integrator equation here, just integrating the incoming power and it's divided by the, the thermal capacitance of this thermal node. So let, let me give you a um, simple example. So consider this single room building here where we have uh, zone temperature the TZ and also wall temperature TV, which is uniform for all the walls and the ceiling, for example. Then we have uh, external influences, which act on the building, for example, the solar radiation phi S, the internal gains, which is kind of um, the uh, energy from electrical devices, the thermal energy you get from electrical devices in the building, phi I, and also the ambient temperature. So these uh, values we can't control, but they uh, influence our model. And the only thing we can control is uh, this uh, radiator power, phi r here. And with that, you can set up this RC equivalent model here, which is known from electrical engineering. And with the equation that I've shown you before, you can then set up a linear differential equation in state space form, which you can see here, which is then well suited uh, for many types of controllers. So what happens here is just you, you write this in a matrix vector form and you by the color coding you see that you just have two states here, the zone temperature and the wall temperature, and the, in red the radiator power and in green the, the external disturbances. Okay, of course the question is how we get these uh, parameters in the model and basically they're just uh, derived by the parameters of the building, for example the dimensions then uh, some kind of U values are considered in the thermal conductance, which is kind of determining how good the insulation of uh, the walls and the ceilings are. You have some kind of solar coefficients, which tell you how much of the solar irradiation is going into the building. And also we have for sure to consider the specific uh, heat capacitances of the individual materials. And then by these formulas, you can get the parameters for your RC model. Now the question is, uh, how do we use that model for control? Yeah, very classical approach for controlling the temperature in rooms or in buildings is just by a simple PI controller, which tracks a certain temperature. Of course, that's not what we want here, because uh, if we stay at a constant indoor temperature, then we can't use the thermal uh, capacitance of the building. And because of that, you want to use a different approach, um, which is model predictive control. And uh, the heart um, of model predictive control is solving uh, re uh, optimal control problems uh, repeatedly. So such an optimal control problem is shown here in the second step on the, on the right hand side, where we minimize a certain cost function over a certain horizon and here. And with this cost function, we can specify which behavior we would like the controller to have, for example, staying at a certain temperature or minimizing the energy demand or also minimizing the energy costs. Then we include the system model, which we derived before in this uh, discrete time form here, xk plus one is equal to this uh, right hand side here, f. This is the uh, model we had before in a discretized form. And we can also consider state and control constraints. Uh, for example, saying that the indoor temperatures should stay between uh, certain bounds, for example, between 18 and 24 degrees, and also the bounds and the inputs, where we can, for example, specify that um, the regular power is limited. And in this set, also weather forecasts are considered. So in our case, this would be forecasts on the ambient temperature and the solar irradiation, and also on the uh, internal gains. And how this control approach works now is that um, you get the indoor temperatures by a certain measurement, then you set up this optimal control problem over a certain horizon, let's say of 24 hours or 48 hours, when you solve this optimal control problem, you apply the first step of the optimal input to the system, and then you measure it again, and by that you get a certain feedback and solve this optimal control problem again. And by that you can consider as before this um, or induce a certain behavior by the objective function. 
Of course, now the question is how do we choose this objective function that this, uh, heavily determines the controller behavior? Uh, and there are different options. Um, for example, this temperature checking, which is the first version I've shown you here of the cost function L, which is uh, uh, makes then the moderately diff controller to stay close to a certain reference temperature XR here. Or we can also pathetically penalize the inputs U here in the, in the second row here of this objective function, so U transpose RU. And the third option would be to consider also price signals, for example, for the electricity price, which is then time varying. So this time varying vector C, K, C of K is kind of an electricity price, which is then multiplied by the U. And U is, uh, if you remember from before, the, the input power of the radiator. Or what you can also do is you can combine all of them by just summing them up and weighting them by certain weighting parameters, gamma 1, gamma 2, and gamma 3. and then you can say, okay, I want to have a combination of all these goals. For example, I want to stay a little bit close to 21 degrees, but I also want to at the same time minimize, um, for example, my energy consumption. And with that, I get a trade-off between these two partially conflicting objectives. So the take-home message here is that this uh, multiple control approach is very flexible. So once you've set it up, you can just change the um, objective function, and then you might get, uh, get um, completely different behavior. Okay, now the question is, of course, how do we implement that? I won't go into two the details here. There are different toolboxes for doing so. For example, the MATLAB MPC toolbox or this, or this MPG toolbox from ETH. And what we use here is a Casati toolbox, uh, which is a uh, very nice toolbox in our opinion, because uh, with that you can use one of the most efficient numerical solvers out there at the moment. And it also provides you with automatic differentiation, which frees you from the need of providing derivatives to the numerical solvers. And how this implementation in general works is first you set up, as I've shown in the talk before and in the slides before, first you set up your ordinary differential equation in your code, then you implement your optimal control problem, meaning that in addition to the model, you also specify your objective function and your constraints, and then in the end, uh, you can run your MPC loop, which I will show you now. In this first part of our code, we load external data. This data includes outdoor temperatures, the solar irradiation, the occupancy and price signals, which are included into our model as disturbances. We continue with the first step of our implementation procedure, which is describing physical laws as ordinary differential equations. Here the modeling is based on the physical principles we have shown in the talk before. We first define physical constants, then we implement the individual physical relations and combine them into our system matrix A and input matrix B. Now discretization follows. We use a zero-order hold discretization, which can be done by the MATLAB command C2D. In the second part of this code snippet, we set all parameters for our MPC controller. This includes defining the prediction horizon of 48 hours, and the weighting matrices Q and R. Furthermore, we define lower and upper bounds on the indoor temperature as well as a desired reference temperature. Now we are ready to construct our optimal control problem in the Casadi toolbox. We specify the numerical solver to be IPOPT, which is a widely used interior point NLP solver. Then we set up our Casadi symbolic variables X for the system states and U for the system inputs over the prediction horizon and MPC. As the optimal control problem cha changes over time, for example, when the weather or the electricity prices change, we construct a parametric optimization problem. By doing so, the changing initial condition, changing weather conditions, and changing electricity prices can be considered. In this loop, we define the objective function and constraints for our optimal control problem. We are able to combine a temperature tracking formulation, an energy minimization formulation, and a cost minimization formulation by weighting the individual objective function terms. The discretized dynamics is considered as equality constraint. Temperature and input bounds are included by inequality constraints. We set the initial condition of our model to a parameter x0, which later on changes in each simulation step. Now we are ready to start our closed loop simulation. In order to do so, we first load the external disturbances for the considered time frame. 
Furthermore, we parameterize our optimal control problem with this data and an initial state. Then we solve the parameterized optimal control problem, which gives us the control input u for the current time step k. Next, we apply this control input to the system model. In reality, this part would be replaced by the physical building. From simulation, we get a new system state, which we then include as initial condition to the next optimal control problem. Now we are ready to run closed loop simulation. At first, we simulate temperature tracking MPC. Here we can see the solver output of IPOPT for each simulation step. Here we see the closed loop temperature profile to resulting space heating inputs for given external disturbances. One can see that the controller tracks 21 degrees very accurately, except for two days where the solar irradiation is quite strong. As the building has no cooling capabilities, we have a temperature overshoot here and here. Furthermore, we see that the used heating power is higher when the outdoor temperature is low. Now we change the objective function to energy minimization by changing the corresponding cost coefficients. We see that the indoor temperature now stays close to the lower bound of the indoor temperature, leading to a lower energy demand. In the last simulation, we show the results for energy cost minimization. Here we can see that the energy cost is lowered as our controller heats up the building when energy is cheap. Combinations of these formulations are possible. This shows that once an MPC scheme is designed, it's very easy to achieve a different goal by just changing the objective function of the controller. This renders MPC a very flexible control approach. Thank you for watching the demo. Um, to wrap up, um, what we did here was to use the um, thermal inertia of buildings to store renewable uh, energy over production. And if you would like to do that, you can uh, use a predictive control approach, uh, which can include weather forecasts to do that. And also a third take-home message is that um, these RC models are usually very suited for this type of control as they are computationally tractable and um, nonetheless provide a sufficient accuracy of uh, sufficient modeling accuracy for this application. Thank you very much, Alexander. Our next presenter will be Benedict Leitner from the Austrian Institute of Technology. Thank you, Tue, uh, and hello and greetings from Vienna. I will present you the tool chain we are using for operational assessment of coupled district heating and electrical distribution networks at AIT. What is our motivation to do so? We are interested in the design and operation of smart local energy communities. So this means, for example, the integration of thermal or electric storages in, in the network, or the use of local renewable energy sources, or to provide services to the electric grid or to the district heating network. And by coupling the two networks, uh, we also want to unlock synergies that were not used until now. We use or we distinguish between the physical system model and the control system model. So basically the physical system model is the networks as is. So basically the electric lines, the transformer, the district heating substations, the district heating pipes, etc. And the control system is basically the thing that actuates the physical system and that decides when to turn off a heat pump, for example, or when to charge or discharge a battery. So there are numerous different approaches to, to model the physical part, to model an electric distribution network or to model a district heating network. There are also numerous different approaches to uh, model control systems. You can use rule-based ones. You can use model predictive control schemes, as we just saw from Alexander's talk. You can have a supervisory controller that controls the uh, overall uh, community, basically, that maybe actuates uh, community battery storage. So one big question is, how 
can we simulate this or are we able to simulate this? Uh, I have to say, unfortunately, there is no single tool that allows us to have a detailed thermal hydraulic model of a district heating network as well as a detailed electrical distribution network, including, for example, a model predictive control scheme or BID controllers or supervisory control. So this is a big problem. Um, and one possible solution to it is co-simulation. Co-simulation basically allows you to use the most suitable tool or the tool that you are the most familiar with to set up your simulation of your energy community or your district or your networks. Um, you can imagine that there are basically very diverse co-simulation setups. Um, you can do a lot of things with co-simulation and I will present you one approach today that we are using at AIT. Our approach is built on the functional mockup interface standard. So this is basically a standard that allows us to encapsulate models and tools in a standardized way and to link those, those tools and models. Uh, it is developed and maintained by a broad community from industry as well as from academia and it already has support for a lot of tools. Using this uh, standard, this functional mockup interface standard, uh, we developed uh, the FMI++ library that allows us to uh, incorporate the tools that we are using at AIT to model different problem setups, basically. I will go into the details of one such problem uh, setup today. So a setup that allows us to model couples, district heating and electrical distribution networks, uh, including control. And I will start with how we model the electrical distribution networks. We think that the electric distribution network needs to be modeled in, in detail to, uh, to assess the effects of time varying loads, time varying generation, for example, from photovoltaic generation or wind generators to include the effects of storages on a temporal resolution of several seconds to minutes. We also want to assess how the different controllers in the network interact with the physical system. So this might be a depth changing controller for a transformer, or we also want to have some kind of coupling with the dynamics of other systems in this case, a district heating system. The tool we are using, therefore, is a Panda Bauer. It is an open source and state-of-the-art electric distribution network uh, modeling tool. It is based on Python, and we developed a tool that allows us to export the Panda Power models as functional mockup units that are uh, based on the functional mockup interface standard to allow us to, to use them in our co-simulation approach. Here, just a small example from Panda Power. Um, you find the role um, user guide online. It's open source and freely available. For district heating networks, there is no quasi static approach that is able to really assess the network on a very local scale. So think about uh, liquid transport through pipes. This might take uh, minutes to hours, or you might have nonlinear storage, storage tanks where you have stratification, where you have a hot and a cold volume in your tanks. So we use dynamic thermal hydraulic model to do so. This basically allows us to really model the network in detail, including valves, including pipes, including district heating substations, and also to have an interface to building models that might be also implemented in Modelico or Dumula. So as a tool, we use uh, Dumula, which offers comprehensive FMI support and basically allows us to export the, the models as functional mockup units again. We developed an open source uh, library to model district heating networks for this. So this district heating network library in Modelica is based on the also open source uh, Epipsa library, which is a very nice library to model thermal hydraulic networks. Here's two examples of how the thermal hydraulic schemes for such district heating network substations might look like. 
So you see that you have different valves, heat exchangers, control sensors that are explicitly modeled in Modelica. For control, we decided to split the different control implementations and to use underpower as well as Dumula to implement the continuous or the direct local uh, controllers. So this might be controllers for pumps or for valves, etc. But for something that provides us uh, some optimality in how we operate the system, we use model predictive control schemes to operate, for example, coupling units between the electric distribution network and the district heating networks. So, for example, to operate a heat pump with a thermal storage tank in a way that is somehow optimal for the networks. We Kappa use Biomo, which is based on Python and is also open source. Uh, this allows us to formulate the model predictive control scheme and we can export it as a functional mockup unit again and use it in our co-simulation approach. So coming to this co-simulation approach, um, as a reminder, it allows us to couple the different tools and, and modeling domains and to simulate them all together. So we use uh, Fumula, which is an add-on to Ptolemy. It provides support for the functional mockup interface standard, and you can have very flexible co-simulation setups uh, with it. So here you see that the model predictive control scheme on the left, which is called control here, gets feedback from the thermal hydraulic models each, at each time step, and then finds some optimal schedules and sends them to the district heating network model. And the power consumption or power generation values of the district heating part are sent to Panda Power, where the uh, quasi-static load flow simulation is done. And I prepared a demo for you, a pre-recorded one, and I hope you find it interesting. So in this demo, I'll present an example of a coupled district heating and electrical distribution network. Uh, the networks are coupled by electric heaters that are combined with a thermal storage tank. And those coupling units are controlled by a model predictive control. We start by uh, going into the details of the district heating network modeling. We use uh, Modelica and Daimola as a modeling tool. Um, so in Daimola we can start by drag and dropping the objects that uh, we want to be in the network and to connect them to larger, uh, to larger systems um, that represent a uh, district heating network in the end we can define various different parameters etc um, this model then can be prepared for the export as a functional mock-up unit uh, we have to define certain inputs and certain outputs the inputs here represent inputs from the model predictive control and the outputs are the power demand of the uh, defined units. Now let's go to the electric distribution network. Uh, we use here a quasi-static approach and use panda power. So basically we can prepare the network, uh, the network topology, all the lines, um, all the components, the connection between the components, uh, the demand profiles and photovoltaic generation profiles and we can then use um, the this part of our model and uh, export it as a functional mock-up unit again where we have to define certain inputs here um, that come from the district heating network model basically so the input uh, is the power demand of the pump and the electric heaters now let's go to the control that is uh, implemented in, Modelic, uh, in uh, Python, IOMO. 
um, to formulate the model directive control. So basically, uh, here we formulate the inputs, um, the bioma model, and the outputs, and then uh, export it as a functional mockup unit again. So to combine all these uh, three models, we use a co-simulation approach, as explained, it is based on the functional mockup interface standard, and we use Fumula um, as an extension of Ptolemy or an add-on for Ptolemy 2. Um, and I'll quickly present how we can set up this co-simulation setup. So basically we open Ptolemy, use um, the different components that are uh, that are given by, by formula. So basically these are functional mockup units for uh, for a constant or fixed uh, step size. And we link the different um, FMUs um, so that they each get the respective uh, input and output basically. Um, so then we save this uh, Ptolemy model and we can then run this simulation for a defined time step, time span. So basically now um, each time step, the model predictive controller updates the set points for the uh, district heating network for the electric heaters and the district heating network model uh, sends the power demand of each unit to the, the electric power demand of each unit to the Panda Power electric distribution network model. After finishing the simulation, we can uh, go to the analysis of results. Um, we, as you see here, we have then access to the temperatures, differential pressure and voltages at a given node. Uh, or the temperature variation in a storage tank, or the, um, the load duration curves of the central heat supply, or um, other important key performance indicators we are interested in. So basically, that was it. If you are now interested and eager to implement uh, your own co-simulation of a coupled district heating and electric distribution network, including model predictive control schemes, um, here are some resources where you find additional information uh, on each simulator. One of the, the, the things you'll notice when I when I go through my slides here is that there's going to be some overlap with some of what you just heard. So in, instead of focusing on all the same things and trying to convince you that co-simulation is the way to go, uh, I will instead show you how the approach that we've taken at DTU to roughly the same problem differs from the presentation you just saw. So I'm not going to go through everything, but I will highlight the differences between them. So as you heard earlier, it's interesting to couple electrical systems to other domains. For example, the other domains might have time delays that we can apply, where you can shift electrical consumption versus heat consumption, for instance. Heat has cheaper storage scaling, so there's a benefit to putting your storage in the heating system rather than the electrical system. While on the other hand, electricity is a lot easier to transport than heat. So there are some benefits that you might be able to achieve there. The system that we'll be looking at today is in a Gidab Norhorn, which is a city district in Copenhagen. It includes uh, both heat pumps coupled into the district heating system. It includes electric vehicles and their charging posts, and there is even a local battery storage. So we're really combining a lot of elements here. One of the things we started looking at here is that saying, well, if we built heat pumps and the heating system is only really able to function if these heat pumps are working, then you might end up having a high risk of system failure. So how does uh, the heating and electrical systems integrate and how do they coordinate? And especially what happens on the heating side when the electrical side is highly stressed. 
And so in order to actually examine that, we need to say, well, electrical side is stressed, means we need we need services from the electrical side. And so that means we need to be able to simulate our system at a submitted time scale. We need to be able to represent both the electrical, thermal, and control domains explicitly. Whatever setup we use has to be able to handle non-functional models. You might have state machines, you might have rule-based control, and so on. That That is not easily representable in a differential equation. And we also need to be able to do automated scenario generation and result analysis. Because if we're going to be looking at many different setups for we could put the heat pumps at various places in the system, it's very beneficial if we don't have to manually describe that system for each uh, setup we want to test. And further, because we're looking into what we will be using in the future, we also want it to be able to include market-based operations. So that means either optimization or connecting into an external process, basically talking to a server. It should also be able to handle agent-based models that might be more complicated than what is easily fitable in there. And so we ended up with basically that the only thing we can do here is uh, co-simulation. Uh, so AIT already mentioned Mosaic earlier, we use it as our primary tool. So what Mosaic allows us to do is to generate a scenario, step through the simulation, handle all the data that comes out, and it allows us to do that in the pure Python, which means that we only had to learn, use one programming language instead of having to, to balance between different ones. And then in addition to that, we build some detailed models per domain at unit level. For example, the district heating system is implemented in Daimola, like the version you just saw. The electrical network is in Panda Power, like the version you just saw. And we can then append to that models for how does building heat and electricity consumption work? How does an electric vehicle charger work? We can build local and supervisory controllers and so on. Because in the end, the thing Mosaic allows you to do is to build everything in Python. As long as you can connect it into Python somehow, you can put it in Mosaic. So for the tool chain, suppose we, we start up with our district heating model, and I'd like to give an overview of how do we end up building a simulation out of that district heating model. So the first thing we do is, as you saw before, we export an FMU so that we have that lying on our, on our desktop somewhere. We then build a Python class that loads up the FMU. In this case, we're also using FMI++ for Python to do this. But the idea is that eventually we end up with something that to Python just looks like a Python class. And somehow there's all the data handling and so on going on inside is wrapped in this Python class. We then write a small mosaic wrapper that translates between what the Python class can talk and the domain-specific language that Mosaic uses, or the co-simulation language that Mosaic uses. And then, taking that, we build our scenario where we take all these wrappers that we've built, and we put them in a scenario together. So you might add into the scenario some other FMU. You might add a controller or an optimization solver that you have in there. You might connect into an external server. If you have a socket connection to that, you can, you can set that up. Uh, you might even connect into a physical unit. So we've actually use Mosaic together with our laboratory and connected it directly into that. And essentially any other thing you can write in Python, you can put in this Mosaic scenario. And finally, once you've instantiated all your various Mosaic wrappers and all your various simulators, you connect them up and you say, well, my district heating model sends the temperature to the Mosaic wrapper on the right. And then somehow the Mosaic wrapper on the right decides what should be the evolved position in my district heating network and sends that information back. And so the main benefit here is that once you've written the Mosaic wrapper and the Python class and so on, you can reuse those in many different simulations. You can pull them in, you can pull them out, and that makes this a very flexible approach. Just like you saw before, you're able to reuse a lot of the work you've already done. And so there is a slight difference in the specific tools, but really that's a matter of taste at this point. I'll get back to you later why you should pick which tools you should. One thing I do want to note is that whereas the tool chain that you just saw has the controller first, sending over to the heating system, sending over to the electrical system. We, we model the units first, then we send signals to the coupling infrastructure, and then we send signals to the controller that send us back a set point. And to demonstrate how that looks, I've prepared a small example run. So we have a heat pump that's in the box down there on the left that's providing some local consumption of solar and feed from the solar panels just on the right inside the box, that would otherwise be wasted. 
And just as a note, this is a synthetic example for a demonstration that he probably is oversized as well as the impedance statistic, and we're simulating one day at 15 minute resolution, basically to get some signals out. So I'd like to swap to the video now. So here we have the district heating system. Hopefully you can see the video here. We have a district heating model in Demola. We then go in just as you saw before and export that using uh, an FMU exporter. And once we have the FMU, we can begin writing our our Python wrapper for it. In our Python wrapper, we define what are the channels that we can do. We can define both input and output channels in, in our model descriptor. And while in principle you could auto-generate that, you could, uh, we, we find that it's easier when you have a fairly small model to just hand write them in there. And below that you find the class that does all the data handling. So when we've written that class, we then set up our scenario by specifying these are the kinds of simulators that we can have in our scenario. We specify how long the simulation should go on for. And finally, we set what is the core simulation time. So instantiate our simulators. We instantiate our entities. And once we've instantiated all these and given them the parameters that we want to have, this is the part where you can uh, script this and set it up to accept parameters. We then connect the various entities together and say, okay, I would like to monitor this parameter here and send this parameter over there. And then once you, you have written that script, you run the simulation. And so that runs for a while. So while that is running, a quick overview on what are we actually simulating here. So when it's instantiated and begins running, this is the system we're actually simulating. Each of the arrows represents a connection we've made in Mosaic. And you can see what each arrow is representing as sending between the different units or entities, which are these boxes that are drawn in. So for example, the local power to heat unit controller sends a set point to the power to heat unit, which then has a certain heat injection and a power draw, which is sent over into the various distribution networks. Finally, when the simulation finishes, we then have a data file on disk that we can analyze afterwards using whatever method is most convenient. And so as an outcome, we can say that using the controller that we built a simple test setup, we saw that we were able to use the red area of the PV production, which would otherwise be wasted as we'd set a limit of 600 kilowatts. Again, synthetic example. We're able to use our heat pump to provide a peak shaving service in order to actually use the pump's PV energy locally. When we do that, we affect the voltages on the bus. You see the y-axis is the voltage, the x-axis is the time. So there's an, an impact on the voltages that we can see. And finally, we can see how the various constraints that are in the heating network are actually translated over. And so for the period around 12, you'll see that here it is the constraint on the condenser side of the heat exchanger, which basically means that the outflow temperature from the heat pump is too low, and so we don't want to activate the heat pump anymore. So I wanted to give you one more slide, which contains some of the other alternatives, because we don't claim that neither AIT or DTU has found the perfect tool chain for doing this. There are other options. And in general, our recommendation at the bottom here is actually that you pick a tool chain that allows you to reuse as much as possible of what you already have. So if you already have everything as Python models, maybe Mosaic makes more sense. Or if you already have the capability of exporting to have used, maybe formula makes more sense in that case. In any case, we we find that core simulation do tool chains are extremely flexible in terms of what time scales we have, how we represent our units, and what the purpose of the simulation is. 
and that they're well suited for large systems with fairly weak coupling. Because once you have weak coupling, you can actually parallel execute the various different models you have. And it might look like I had to write a lot of code for this, but the thing about this is that not everything's off the shelf, but there's a lot of experience in the field. And so there's a lot of opportunities to actually expand what you have here. And with that, I'd like to hand over to our, our final presenter, who is Frank Meinke Hubini from Energievil Viso. Yeah, good afternoon, good evening, everyone. Greetings from Brussels. Um, I'm uh, a researcher in the unit for uh, Smart Energy and Built Environment in Vito, and we do quite a lot of uh, scenario analysis work. And I would like to share some insight if you think about local energy communities and, and local smart local energy system in uh, energy system models. Uh, energy system models try to achieve uh, two things. Uh, they would like to integrate uh, technology and the techno-economic uh, projections of a technology evolution. They think about economic aspects because uh, you have a cost-minimizing objective underlying the model, and they would like to incorporate behavior and policy goals. And they try to integrate this into one model. If you uh, look into an overview of models, and uh, models, of course, simulate from seconds to decades and have different levels of control and uncertainty. Uh, the model I talk about now is used for overall system planning and scenario analysis. So we're all the way at the lower right corner. So we think in decades and the evolution of an overall energy system. I would like to explain uh, our approach on the TIMES model. This is something we use in our team for, for 20 plus years. We are integrated in this ADSAP community of research institutes all over the world over 60 of them who uh, use this model and constantly contribute to the further development of this model. So uh, what is unique about this? It has multi-objective. Uh, so it takes, for example, the potential of renewables, of energy efficiency, of CO2 targets into consideration. It projects into future uh, technically feasible pathways. So it's, it's based on parameters that an expert researcher like our team puts into the model. And it shows different uh, pathways that are that are really possible, and you can learn uh, insights of risk, costs, and benefits by comparing these different scenarios. So the approach is not to predict the perfect future, but look into different scenarios, and 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 these scenarios are based on assumptions, and you can learn from comparing these scenarios and going different pathways. These models report quite detailed on energy consumption, on material consumption, on costs but also on emissions, usually on CO2 emissions, but they're perfectly capable also to report on other emissions as well. This is a, an overview graph uh, of, of an energy system model here, uh, a TIMES model. If you look at the left side, uh, inputs are resource availability, for example, uh, natural gas resources, but also land resources to build a PV system or onshore or offshore wind. And on the right side, you have demands, and the demands are not uh, specified in petajoule or kilowatt hours, but real end-use demands. So we talk about a heating demand, a cooling demand, or person kilometers. And everything in this dotted line is basically what is integrated in these models. And it's really the conversion from primary energy to final energy, going through end-use technologies to providing services. And these arrows at the top and at the bottom show you what you can put into the model. So you can, for example, have a policy constraint and say you want a reduction in CO2 emissions for the overall system. But you can also put assumptions about energy efficiency of buildings and, and a certain uptake of renewables and if you choose so. And then the arrows pointing out of the model show you what is usually uh, reporting. You may wonder by now why such a model has been used within the, the SMILES context, where we talk about uh, smart local energy communities. So what motivated us was to look uh, from a different angle uh, at the same problem. So while these local simulations often aim to really represent one-on-one -on -one, uh, the functioning of, of a local energy system and the interaction between the components, uh, they often address very specific questions. For example, what is the optimal sizing of a boiler? 
what is uh, the the impact of a new urban quarter on the larger district heating system that is already existing. So all we aim to reduce, for example, an electricity peak demand. And these are all very valuable questions, but they do not necessarily give you answers if you are thinking about pathways and projecting futures over decades. So aspects that are not captured in local simulation tools is, for example, a cost optimization. It doesn't often take into account investment cost, operational costs. You don't have the comparative uh, aspect uh, where you compare one technology with, with another, another technology. And often you only have a snapshot in time, so you don't look into evolutions of components, for example, that you have a, a drop in cost uh, for battery investments or that you have rising efficiencies of certain technologies. So why is this unique and why is this part of a research project, you may ask yourself. Uh, what you see is that the energy system models often evolve over time and uh, they have a wealth of information in there, but they're quite high level because they combine a bottom-up technology representation with statistical data. And uh, what you find is that the, the different technologies and the demand categories are not really detailed enough to, to look into interactions on a smart local energy system where you have a combination of heat and electricity, you have thermal storage, you have electrical storage, and you have a quite variable renewable generation. So, um, and this is a challenge you have when you would like to transfer these system into, uh, into a larger model. The good news is a lot of good data becomes available. Uh, we see a lot of uh, Horizon 2020 projects focusing on this. Uh, there are also statistical data, for example, the JRC released last year, the ideas database. So these are the good news. Uh, in addition, you see continued funding for projects uh, looking into energy efficiency, demand side flexibility, consumer behavior. So if you want to integrate these, I think we need to take a step in this direction, understand the optimization of local systems better. A second aspect is that the overall energy system has one underlying cost minimization. So if you, for example, have a boundary condition to reduce a certain percentage of CO2 emissions, the model will look for the best technological pathway to achieve this goal. But that might mean that you, for example, have a lot of CO2 emission reductions in the industrial sector, and not in the residential sector. Looking into this in reality and at the current policy goals and discussions we have about local energy communities, etc., you may ask yourself if this is realistic that we start to decarbonize only the industrial sector and kind of put the residential sector in whole. I don't believe this is the case and that's where we need to look into individual sectors as well and analyze the dynamics here and this is what we try to do in this project. So we had to make some improvements to these models and I will explain to you a bit what we did to, to give you a feeling for it. So a traditional times model is often uh, built with 12 to 16 time slices representing the dynamic over a whole year. And uh, what we have done here in our approach, uh, and that is based on, on a PhD study we had, we have increased uh, this from 12 time slices to 120 time slices. And at the bottom, you see kind of uh, the 10 days, uh, and each of the day is sliced into two hourly time slices. So you have a real differentiation of peak performance of renewable generation, peak demand periods, and the transition periods in between. A second aspect we really looked into is the demand side. While the demand was quite detailed, I had a quite detailed representation before, uh, we chose in our project here the example of the residential sector. So we realized that we have a typical uh, daily load profile, and this is just combined by the de degree days, meaning the difference between outside and inside temperature over the year to have a seasonal variation. Uh, looking into the different technical components, we realized we really have to do our homework and increase the resolution and the detail. So we now have uh, for every months of the year, for weekdays and for uh, weekend days differentiations. And in addition, we have a layer representing the um, temperature. So you really have to go back and do this. Again, 
a lot of data is available, for example, on the JRC database. Uh, but you have to be also careful when you work in these existing models that statistical data that is available may not match your categories that you have in your model. So there's probably some conversion required to, to adjust these moments. And uh, a last aspect of improvement, just to give you a few highlights, is uh, what we call here technology deep dives. So typically in energy system model, you, you have a model, it's described by investment cost, by operational cost. Also, you define some periods when it's available or not, for example, for solar or wind. And then you have the technologic evolution over time. For example, you may assume that a, a wind turbine is becoming cheaper over time or also is becoming more efficient over the decades. If you really want to model local systems, and we have a, a short, uh, this diagram shows a very simple uh, test case that we used here in our consortium. And you think about the heat pump, you really have to, to think about how a heat pump operates under different conditions. And the challenge here is that you don't only look at the snapshot a moment in time, but you have to think about the, a combination of different technologies. So you can, for example, prescribe that the heat pump has to work in the evenings when people come home and have a demand for hot water. But if you combine this heat pump with a thermal uh, storage at the larger water tank, then it would make sense to operate the heat pump during the noon hours when the sun is shining and you have PV generation and electricity to fill the thermal storage. And then from this thermal storage, you uh, retrieve your hot water in the evenings. But then you really have to think about the heat pump and what kind of simplification are correct and where do you start to misrepresent this. So here I can highly recommend to work very closely with system experts together and think about these different technologies and really dive deep to uh, learn what you need to do and what you can do in simplifications. In our uh, uh, work we have done here, we, we have linked our technology choices and examples to the work uh, from our research partners. You have heard most of them already, and we thought about uh, different aspects. I will not go through all of them, but for example, we linked uh, the investment in battery capacity to PV capacity. Uh, we thought about scenarios with heat pumps, solar collector and thermal storage, and we also forced scenarios uh, with electrical and thermal storage capacities. We also looked into uh, policy choices and, for example, said that even the residential sector would occur a carbon price. In some countries in Europe, we have this already established. In others, uh, this is being discussed right now on a policy level. The second part, I would just like to briefly present a little bit what we have as uh, draft results here. And here you see one scenarios with results for 2050 for these 10 separate days. And you can see, for example, on the two left sides, you see the light blue. Uh, this is electricity that is withdrawn from the uh, grid uh, to serve the residential sector. You have in the days that are shown in the middle, you see the orange. This is PV generation. And uh, the blue line that flows through it shows you the electricity demand on the different days of the year. So you have also negative bars, and there you see there are periods where we see yellow, and yellow means you charge batteries, and then we have periods where you see green, where the residential PV feeds into the grid. So you see the dynamic over these different days of the year. The next slide uh, shows two days in a bit more detail, and again, uh, you see the light blue, the orange, the yellow, and the green color. And what you also see is a good reminder that we do not only have a representation of electricity, but for electricity and thermal demand. So the bars you see above the blue line represent the, the thermal demand, and part of it is served by electricity. Part of it is served by district heating, for example. So you see nicely the dynamic between the different days. Another aspect. Here we again see uh, results from a 2050 scenario. And here is a comparison between different uh, scenarios. So all the way to the left, you have the base scenario where all the electricity is consumed by electric appliances. And then the further you go to the right, you see introduction of solar hot water technologies. 
then you see heat pumps, then you see with a storage, then you see pure heat pumps, and then you see um, a scenario with uh, heat pumps, thermal and electrical storage. And then this orange color comes in and there you see that electricity is also used to serve thermal appliances. But because of the level of detail we have now in our model, we can also differentiate. You see the gray striped area is the electricity that is consumed from the grid. And the yellow striped area is the electricity that is consumed directly from their own PV panels and didn't have to enter into the local low voltage grid. So summarizing in two slides, uh, what are the main takeaways? The challenging aspects to do this is that uh, the model platform, like an energy system model, can really be improved to represent these technologies. But quite detailed work of reviewing data and assumptions is necessary, and this is often quite labor intensive and more labor intensive than expected. So one should really think about uh, the resources if they're able to do this. The second aspect is that you really have to have in-depth technology knowledge. Uh, you really have to uh, pair up with system simulation experts, which we were able to do here in the consortium, or you have experts in your respective uh, research institutes. And then defining technologies, I refer to the example with the heat pump and the potential investment of thermal storage in the future. How do different technologies really operate in the future? Because you don't know if your model decides into uh, electric batteries or into a thermal storage device. So this is uh, something you really have to think about that is a bit challenging. On a positive note, I do believe that these energy system tools have a role to play because they enable you to better understand how an energy system can evolve over decades, how uh, different scenarios have an impact. For example, if you uh, have a policy that pushes really for the implementation of heat pumps, this is something you see in the Netherlands or Belgium at the moment. Would that trigger also investment in thermal storage or in electrical storage, and how would this interact? So you can really observe the, the, the dynamic in local energy system. You can compare different scenarios and, and different levels of penetration, for example, of certain technologies, and you can evaluate these, these uh, pathways. And the model is, is geared and was developed in the last decades to really track very detailed investment utilization and these kind of aspects. So uh, the reporting is, is very well established and a lot of people who know the interfaces. So this is really a, a strong suit. And of course, uh, specific aspects are implementable in this. You have to get into the code and into the models. But for example, I showed you the example that we focused on a decentralized renewable consumption versus uh, consumption from the grid. So this concludes my presentation. Thank you very much, Frank. So all in all, you, you've seen the different research questions of uh, a few different groups. You've seen some of them are fairly aligned, some of them are fairly wide apart. And uh, we hope we've given you a flavor of how the specific tools we have allow us to address that particular research question. The main takeaways that you should have from this is that the tool chains that we're building, working with here are highly individual. They're fairly specific for individual tasks, not just that they're constructed in different languages, but that the entire approach is often quite different. They might focus on larger and smaller scale systems. They might focus on design or operation or investment, um, and they might be able to be combined to get the best of all the worlds in some sense, either through course of relation, as you saw earlier, or through uh, simulation transfer and discussion, as you saw in this last presentation. Uh, none of the tool chains that we've shown you are, are kind of standardized. There's no real standards in the field. And so there's real opportunity to make a, make a mark in this field and set up something that is going to help a lot of people simulate tools going forward. We hope we've provided you with some anchors for your own investigations. If you've seen anything today that you say, I need that tool, you should talk to us. We, we'd love to share because each of our tool chains only gets stronger if more people use them. But then of course that doesn't answer everything, right? There's still some open questions because what if you don't know exactly what you want or need to do? Or what if you have a simulation running in one tool chain and you'd like to use some of the features we've shown you today? How can you transfer between those? Or maybe you know something about one of the systems we've talked about, but you don't really know much about the other ones. How do you get started simulating those other layers? 
Well, if you've been asking yourself those questions, then we hope that we'll see you in our next webinar, uh, where we're going to present some of the tools we've developed in the project to help you out with answering exactly these questions and that have other benefits as well. Um, and other than that, you have the various partners that you've seen today. You've also, you also have a general contact information for both what we'll show you in webinar two and for general information. And you have the SMAS website on the right hand side there.